Oh. I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Hello and welcome back to more Films That Are Constant Critique, where we take a look at films. Some good, some bad, and some downright awful. I'm Bongo Baikov, joined by our host, Maverick Drenzaria. This week we're taking a look at the films Indiana Jones, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. More Lucasfilm productions. Like, we haven't done enough of those. <laughs> we, we won't stop until we're through every single thing Lucasfilm has made. We're not, uh, I'm not sitting through more American graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> or fucking Radioland murders. God damn it. <laughs> but Howard the Duck is fine with you. I would be open to doing Howard the Duck, though. <laughs> How dare you. <laughs> Uh, what's one thing I find funny though? While I was reading a bit about uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, it um, their original plan for the sequels was they were going to have Raiders in all the titles. Oh, Raiders of the Temple of Doom or uh, Raiders of the Last Crusade, <laughs> <laughs> Raiders of the Crystal Skull. I don't. Oh know. no! Please no. Yeah, but Indiana Jones, of course, that became the brand name. Um, and the original yeah, title... That, that stuck a little more. The original title of was Raiders of the Lost Ark, but then in some places it gets retitled as Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And that was the first movie. It was released on June 12th, 1981. It cost $20 million and made $389.9 million, which made it the highest grossing film of that year. Yeah, that that's that's impressive. Only a twenty million budget, and it was directed by Steven Spielberg. Which is that our first movie that he directed? It's taken this long to get to one of his movies, apparently. <laughs> and of course, he collaborated on this with uh, George Lucas. Um, yep, and Lawrence Kasdan helped write it, so you get some Star Wars connections with this one. And Howard uh, Kazanjian, he helped produce this, and he produced uh, Return of the Jedi. Okay. Ben Burt did the sound effects. John Williams did the music. You know, you could, the list goes on, you know, even to the cast. Yeah, but, it, but anyway. It's not just that it has an all-star cast. It also is just everyone behind it is, like, the best person that you could have picked. Yes. Um... And yeah, is this is Spielberg and George Lucas at the height of their powers, which, and unfortunately, they're now shadows of their past selves. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, at least they gave us this series. Um, yeah, <laughs> and I will say before we get into the, it's probably this series and Star Wars more than any others that got me interested, like in filmmaking. Mm. Because for one, I mean, I loved them, obviously. They were great movies, but I also remembered, like, reading about the making of these films. I have a, I, upstairs, I have a book <clears throat> called The Complete Making of Indiana Jones. I remember reading that and being, like, interested in, like, how they did the special effects and, like, all that stuff. You know, how the development process, just all the, all that, and... And another thing about yeah. this movie, I'll admit, as a kid, I didn't really pay that much attention to Harrison Ford as Han Solo in the Star Wars movies. I was more into the Jedi and Sith characters, mm -hmm. mainly Vader and Yoda. Because I, I saw the I, I first saw Star Wars when I was like five or six. To be fair, <laughs> um, however, when my dad told me. That the same guy who played Indiana Jones was also in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, that that would tend to pique your interest. That blew my mind, and thanks to that, Harrison Ford was like my favorite actor for a while, because he's like my two favorite like film series, you know. And you can find like yeah. tons of like pictures of me as a kid dressed as Indiana Jones, you know. So obviously, there is a I have a lot of nostalgia for this series. Along with Star Wars, obviously. Like, behind Star Wars is probably the second most, like, watched film series, <laughs> for me, at least. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it is definitely a very rewatchable thing. It, it, probably not quite to the same extent for me as Star Wars is, where I watch Star Wars like at least two or three times a year. But I do tend to watch this at least once a year, like this whole series, or at least the trilogy. The, the first three. <laughs> the first three. Oh. <laughs> and then, for me, I, I actually didn't watch these... Uh, for a little while, I was maybe like 12 or 13 when I first watched Raiders. I think I first and... saw these, I was probably like 9 or 10. Hmm. It was around when Kano with the Crystal Skull came out. Because hmm. I remember okay. I had a lot of friends, uh, Max mainly, uh, <laughs> they were talking about Indiana Jones. I remember like hearing that name and thinking, is he like a, I was imagining him as like a Native American or something, you know, because I, I didn't know what Indiana <laughs> Jones was. And, but then he was like telling me about it. I'm like, oh, wow, that sounds fucking awesome, actually. Um, and then eventually I, you know, I saw the the first one I saw was actually Last Crusade, believe it or not. Mm. Yeah, I, I actually thinking about it, I don't know if I watched this first or played the Lego game first. I definitely saw the movies, for, although I did read the novelizations before i saw the movies oh really so i actually knew all the plot beats like i wasn't allowed to watch yeah. temple of doom for like years because of how mm. uh fuck is some of the stuff it does <laughs> yeah um but i knew everything that happened in it because i had the novelization of it and i'd read it several times so <laughs> yeah so it's funny, I'd be like talking, I'd be telling people everything that happened in Indiana Jones, even though I hadn't actually seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but you saw him when you were 12 or 13, that's interesting. I think I was yeah, like... Yeah, no, it was much later for me than I think most people. We get in, getting into the cast. Um, Obviously, the main star of the show, yeah, Harrison Ford. Yep. They Although they originally did not want him. Really? Because George Lucas was like, he didn't want Harrison Ford to become his uh, Robert De Niro. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to just keep <laughs> casting him over and over again. So the original choice uh, was Tom Selleck. Oh. But huh. he had a contractual obligation to be on the show Magnum P.I., which became really popular, obviously, but yeah. so he couldn't play the role. But there is a screen test, like, on YouTube, if you're like curious um, to see, what... kind of, I do kind of wanted to see that. That would have been weird, I think. It, it is kind of weird, yeah. <laughs> Watching, <laughs> and if Harrison Ford wasn't already a big star, then this movie definitely skyrocketed his yeah. career, made him like. Because I mean, Star Wars was huge, but Harrison Ford wasn't the hugest part of it. Yeah, you know. Again, like you said, he wasn't a Jedi or a Sith. Yeah, he so. was like, yeah. I didn't really pay him as much attention when I was a kid. I just thought of him as like, he gets frozen in carbonite. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> uh, and he has a cool looking ship. Karen Allen, which her career didn't really go anywhere. Like, you'd think, like, maybe she'd be a bigger star than she was, but, like... I don't even really know what she's in. Although I do know... I have seen a few other movies she's in. She was in uh, Scrooged. Oh, she's in Animal House. In Anim yeah, she was in Animal House. I think that's the part that got her the role in this movie, if I remember right. And then she does pop up in a later film of this series. Yep. I forgot she was in Cruising. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul Freeman plays the villain, one of the villains in this, Belloc. Yep. And he's also in Hot Fuzz. Ooh, really? Yep, he plays the Reverend. He plays the Reverend in Hot Fuzz. Oh, yeah. And he's really good in that movie, too. Yeah. Um, uh, Ronald Lacey, he... Uh, basically a guy who spent his acting career getting typecast as villains because of this movie <laughs> <laughs> and one thing that's interesting he was his character uh tote he plays the ss guy yep he was supposed to have a machine gun arm 
I actually, I was reading about the character earlier today, and I saw the concept art for that. And he's just going to be like, t- yeah, like a cyborg or something, which I think yeah. they were considering doing that with uh, Vogel in Last Crusade as well, if I remember right, but I guess huh. they ditched it. <laughs> it probably, yeah, maybe, at- maybe that would have been too silly, I don't know, but I kind of would have liked to have seen that. <laughs> it would have been interesting to see. But he is a memorable villain, nonetheless. Yes. Although an interesting oh, thing about apparently... um, Tote is uh, Klaus Kinski was one of the original choices to play him. Huh. Uh, but Kinski hated the script. He like called the script a piece of shit. He didn't want to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Which, considering how many terrible movies that guy ended up in, I mean, he was clearly a <laughs> good judge of scripts um yeah john reese davies is in this as sala one of my favorite side characters he's really good at this yeah and thanks to this movie he ended up getting typecast in <laughs> several indiana jones ripoffs made by canon <laughs> <laughs> he's in sahara he's in firewalker he's in king solomon's minds <laughs> It's really hilarious to me that that happened. <laughs> yeah. And he's probably most well known for voicing Man Ray in SpongeBob. Uh, no, Gimli is probably his most famous. Oh, yeah. Girl in Lord of the Rings. But yeah, I associate him with uh, Gimli and uh, Sala, obviously. But yeah, he did voice Man Ray in SpongeBob. <laughs> uh, and their original choice was uh, Danny DeVito, actually. <laughs> that would have been very different but he was too expensive um and he ended up in uh, romancing the stone which is another it's often regarded as like an indiana jones like derivative uh one of the better ones though um and he's pretty funny in it ain't to be denholm elliott as uh marcus brody he doesn't get a whole lot of screen time in this one but he's a good character though yeah, and then I'd say when he does get more screen time in the later ones, I do really enjoy his character. In this movie, at least, he's more like a voice of reason. Yeah, and in the other one, he's more of comic relief. And what's interesting is Denholm Elliott, he's in, like, two different versions of Hound of the Baskervilles. Really? And one of those adaptations is good, and the other is a complete piece of shit. Um, <laughs> Avoid the one that was the... uh comedy version and we also got the return of pat roach yep that's right because he's uh very memorable scene in this one. Oh yeah absolutely well he is two memorable scenes in this he's also the big sherpa guy oh the two fight scenes of this movie he's the big sherpa guy and then he's the guy the shirtless mechanic dude yeah. Beats the shit out. <laughs> he beats the shit out of Harrison Ford twice in this movie. Um, and there's also the film debut of Alfred Molina. That's right. He goes from being covered in tarantulas in this movie to playing a Spider-Man villain in Spider-Man 2. <laughs> One with multiple arms. Doc Ock, yep. <laughs> so, getting to our initial thoughts um obviously i love this movie i mean it's yeah i would say this is just one of my favorite movies of all time i think that's fair to say um it's one of the best examples of an adventure serial which that's what they were going for with this is they were trying to like emulate like adventure films like the 30s and 40s and this one does it so well it's very entertaining the, the, it's paced well brilliant writing and acting i mean it's perfect yes. escapist entertainment it's like for me it's a when i was rewatching, it's it's a toss-up for me between this and jaws for my favorite spielberg movie i i think i'd have to choose I think I'd have to choose either this or Last Crusade, honestly. 
<laughs> like if there's any problem I have with like the sequels to this, it's that they're not as good as the Raiders of the Lost <laughs> Ark. But like, which, to be fair, yeah, no, Raiders is insanely strong. It's one of those movies where it's not only a well-made movie; it's also incredibly fun to watch. Yes, there really aren't any bad scenes. Like each scene feels like it's supposed to be there. I actively can't really think of any huge issues i have with this movie so yeah and i i would just add on to it if you nitpick it yeah you might find something but like i mean it comes together perfectly i think at least for me yeah yeah i think just kind of on top of that uh the story is like it's just about perfect, especially when they're trying to replicate the sort of serial feel of it. Because your good guys and your bad guys are just so well-defined. Yes. Because <laughs> yes. you have the Nazis who definitely feel evil. And then you have... They feel like an actual threat in this one. They do. That's one... I'll get into this a little more maybe later, but like Last Crusade, I do really enjoy, obviously, but like I didn't feel like the Nazis felt like as big of a threat in that one. I, I will say they do feel more like comic y sort of villains in the third Last one. Last Crusade's but... a much more like lighthearted movie than this. Yeah. Like this one, I feel like there's actual stakes. And maybe that's another yeah. problem I have with like the movies after this is like the stakes don't feel as high as in this one because like if the nazis get the ark of the covenant then the whole world's fucked basically you can't really (laughs) get like (laughs) the stakes can't really get higher than that i mean yeah you know Uh, did you have anything else to add or uh i don't think I i think i've kind of just spread my thoughts around the intro to this where it's great cast this is honestly probably one of my favorite uh, musical scores composed by John Williams. Oh my god, yes. Just, the uh, whole thing is fantastic. The main theme is yeah. like one of the most iconic themes in just anywhere, like in anything. I mean, you know, it's just like... It, the theme definitely reminds me of Hydelide for some reason. <laughs> I, I can't put my finger on it. Hydelide, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> Uh, you know what? One movie which has a very similar music score to this is Turkish Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> Turkish Star Wars is my favorite John Williams score. Uh, this is your second favorite, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, it, 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 all joking aside, though, it is it is a perfect music score. I mean, I think yeah. all all the Indiana Jones movies have great scores, but this one especially. Yeah. It just, it fits, it's exciting, but it also has this sense of, like, you know, mystery to it, like, when they're uncovering yeah. stuff, you know? It, it feels like an adventure. Yeah, it's it's definitely a huge part of why the movie works. Not, like, the hugest. That would be, uh, but yeah, like, the huge reason this movie works, though, for me, is Harrison Ford, obviously. Yes, he sells the character. Indiana Jones is one of my favorite characters in film. I mean, as a kid, I wanted to fucking be him. I mean, <laughs> for fuck's yeah. sake, you know. <laughs> and the casting and I mean, is just perfect. Like it is. Like he's badass, but he's also he's not like a superhuman. You know. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's not perfect, he has flaws, you know, which makes the fight scenes, like, all the more, like... In- investing. Investing, yeah, say. because, you know, at first he's, like, getting his ass kicked, but then he eventually just comes back, the theme starts playing, and it's great, you know? Yeah, and it usually there's some way where he has to outsmart whoever he's up against. And that, too, yeah, he's... It's not just raw strength. Because he gets compared to James Bond some, and obviously he was based a bit off of... Like James yeah. Bond, but he's very different from Bond because James Bond, he usually has to use like gadgets and stuff to like escape. Whereas Indiana Jones, he usually like, he has to like think through things a little bit more, you know? Yeah. 
Um, and apparently, uh, uh, George Lucas originally named him Indiana Smith. Mm, that is good. Doesn't have the same punch as Jones. And then Spielberg said he should be named Indiana Jones, which, yeah, that definitely is a better name, man. And again, Harrison Ford, he's lucky. He's like, he played two characters in two of the most iconic film series of all time. I mean, yeah, most actors, they're lucky to even have one of those, you know, let alone <laughs> two. I mean, and obviously Indiana Jones is probably the role he's associated with the most. Yeah, just because he's center stage. With yeah, this exactly. Um, and it's also and, the costume and, is very memorable. I was just about to mention, like, everything about his appearance is iconic. Whether it's the fedora. The fedora, the satchel, the leather jacket, the whip, of course. The whip. The whip is a very... While rewatching these, I realized, you know, the whip was a very unique choice of weapon. Yeah. For him in these movies. Obviously, he has a gun as well, but, like, he used the whip way more than he used the gun. Like, he uses it to, like go places you know he has to like swing across somewhere and he uses it to like disarm people like the yeah. first scene the opening is such a great character like introduction it really is it shows that he's fearless because he's not running away from all of this he disarms the one guy using the whip he's able to outsmart basically all of these traps that are all like the spike traps and the arrows that shoot out of the wall he isn't quite able to outsmart the weight trap, but... Or, uh, Alfred Molina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that one line where he says, uh... Where Alfred Molina, like, says, like, there's nothing to fear here, and then Indiana Jones, he, like, pushes him against the wall and says, that's what scares me. So, yeah. he is terrified, but he's just able to keep his cool, so, I mean, he looks like he keeps his cool. Um... He, like, knocks the gun out of the guy's hand with a whip and turns around, and just that first shot where you see him, it's it's perfect. <laughs> the openings to these movies kind of feel like James Bond openings. They do, and that becomes especially apparent with, I think, the next one. Temple of Doom, yes, definitely. Um, Which, I, I'll, I'll talk about that one more when we get there, but I absolutely love the opening to Temple of Doom. I do too, yeah, I do too. And I love the jungle setting, too. I kind of wish this... There's part of me that almost wishes just this movie took place in the jungle. Because that's usually what I imagine Indiana Jones being like. Just yeah. this guy who wanders through a lot of jungles, just cutting through foliage, you know? I will say, like, that that opening is incredibly iconic. But, like, we never really get back to that jungle setting in any of the movies, really. Until, uh... <laughs> and, yeah, until Crystal Skull. But on top of that, the idol at the beginning, that's also kind of an iconic piece, like a, like a pretty iconic prop from this movie, and it's never really there much. It's it, it's only in the intro for maybe like three minutes, and then it's gone for the rest of the franchise. It has nothing to do with the main plot, and yet it's like, this whole se this is probably the most iconic like scene in the whole movie is where he's like, he grabs yeah. the idol, he's just being chased by the boulder, and it has nothing to do with the main plot, but it is such yeah. an exciting action scene. It's been parodied so many times, you know. UHF did it. Yeah, yeah, that is, yeah. Um, and the boulder looks like, okay, another thing we have to talk about, the set design in this movie it's just impeccable it's top notch like this looks like an actual temple ruin here yeah you just fully believe that wherever the scene is taking place that's where they are yeah and then while we like we get to later like the temples and stuff yeah like when they're in that tomb underground yeah with all the snakes <laughs> and there's also and then i guess we you touched... get introduced to our main villain <laughs> belloc <laughs> A French archaeologist. He's not. He wasn't actually played by a French dude. If you didn't know, no. <laughs> I couldn't tell. Like at some points, I couldn't tell if he was even trying to do a French accent or not. <laughs> but like, there's sometimes where he gets really heavy into it. Other times where he backs way off. Yeah, but you get a great villain line here where he grabs the idol from him and <laughs> says, "Uh." Dr. Jones, again you find there is nothing you can possess, which I cannot take away. 
I mean, that, that's such a great introductory line for your character. Like, you know immediately what this guy is about. And Belloc is such... I love Belloc as a villain. That's something <laughs> I realized, like, rewatching this. Part of why this is my favorite Indiana Jones movie is I, I feel like the villains just never got better than Belloc. Belloc is very strong, especially since he's kind of a foil. He's a he's like Indy. a mirror image to they kind of tried to do that with Donovan, but not as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he's like a mirror image of Indiana Jones. There's even like one scene where he, he says like you were a shadowy imitation of myself or something. Yeah, something like that. It, and it's kind of like the Joker in <laughs> the Dark Knight. Yeah. And a lot of my favorite lines are just from Belloc, because he is just such an asshole. <laughs> like, <laughs> he is like... I, I just love how smug and condescending <laughs> this guy is. Like, he's like just always like one step ahead of Indiana Jones, like... And he's always and taking. It's shown that he's he's always taking to to... everything from him, you know. Just like I yeah. got what you don't have, you know. It's just, and he, I find it interesting. Also, he's working with the Nazis, even though I, he I was... doesn't really like them that much. Yeah, I, I was just about to say he'll really do anything to achieve his goal, which is shown uh, twice very well. So obviously him siding with the Nazis to get like the unlimited resources. And the Nazis the don't even like him either. <laughs> no, everyone thinks he's an asshole. <laughs> they only but have the him beginning, because they need him. <laughs> but also at the beginning, he went to the length of learning the language of the native people there to get them to stop Indy once he came out of the temple. Yep. It's too bad the Jovitos don't know you like I do, Belloc. <laughs> If only you spoke their language. Only you spoke Javito, yeah. It's... <laughs> I think one of my favorite scenes in this movie is this part. It's after uh, Indiana Jones, he thinks Marion got blown up. Oh, yeah. And he goes to this bar and Belloc is there. That That is a pretty good one, yeah. And he's just talking to Belloc. I love how he's not even looking at him for most of this conversation. <laughs> Yeah. He's just, he has, and he's, anytime he does say something, it's just with the utmost contempt. Like, you definitely buy that these two just hate each other so much. And it's just, great. and th there's just great line delivery here, too. Like, you feel kind of the hatred coming off of Indy. There's some really good scene. lines here I want to mention. Like, Belloc, he says, like, he likes it, shows this, like, pocket watch. He says, look at this, it's worthless. $10 from a vendor in the street, but I take it, I bury it in the sand for a thousand years, it becomes priceless. <laughs> yeah. I just love that and then, line. Also when Belloc is talking about I am a shadowy reflection of you. I'll take only a nudge to make you like me. To push you out of the light. Now you're getting nasty. I think my I'm, favorite line during this, well, one of them, there's so many good lines, but oh, yeah. one that I really like is like, <laughs> <laughs> when Belloc's like talking about the Ark and then yep, and yeah, I was Jones, just about to mention that one he's going to reach for his gun he says you want to talk to God let's go see him together I've got nothing better to do because <laughs> I, I, I he just has at that point in the movie he just he gives no fucks because yeah. he thinks Marion's dead the Nazis are basically ahead of him he has nothing to live for at that point so he's thinking well, I might as well take Belloc with me while I have the chance. <laughs> Just a great scene. And then another scene later in the movie when uh, the Nazis uh, reach, the, the, they find the Well of Souls. They find him digging there. Yep. <laughs> and then Belloc, he's, he's just down there in that hole, and then Belloc's like, <laughs> saying like what are you doing it's such a nasty place you know <laughs> and then india jones says why don't you come down here and i'll show you and Belloc <laughs> says thank you my friend but i think we are all very comfortable up here <laughs> <laughs> and then probably my so, favorite my fa i think this is my favorite exchange in the whole movie where Belloc's like <laughs> 
because he's down there in the temple with all those like you know ruins and stuff and like dead bodies and snakes and he's like trapped oh, yeah. and the Nazis are all up there and they have the ark what a fitting end to your life's pursuits you're about to become a permanent addition to this archaeological find who knows in a thousand years even you may be worth something <laughs> son of a bitch because <laughs> there's probably a part of it that he like finds it Actually, kind of funny, but he's also like going, ah, I'm fucked, aren't I? <laughs> I can't do I, it as good. It's delivered so perfectly. Yeah. I can't. It, it's rep- delivered in the way that only really Harrison Ford can, which is just so like deadpan, serious, but there's also like that, you know, that little bit of humor that's in there too. Yeah. And then I think another scene in this movie that I especially love is really the only scene that has a huge amount of exposition, which is when uh, Indy is called to talk uh, to the, I think they're members of the government about the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, well, I can't remember what their names were. The assignment. I can't remember what their names were, but Marcus Brody's there too. Yep. I know what scene you're talking about. Because they basically have Indy, who is a professor of archaeology, giving essentially a small lecture on what the Ark of the Covenant is, what, you know, it's said in the the Bible it can do. Yeah. As well, yeah. And so it's just a great way to set that off for later in the film when they actually find it and eventually open it, which we'll get to. That's how you do exposition right there, you know, just like... And it's really the only time in the movie there's any big bit of exposition and it's done really well. Oh, there's another one where they're talking to that old dude about the staff oh, yeah. that's later in the movie. Um, and it's also just funny seeing him, like, you see this whole opening action scene where he's, like, out in the jungle getting all dirty and stuff, and then all of a sudden he's in a classroom teaching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, he's, like, a professor, basically. And apparently some of his students are really attracted to him, which, I mean, can you blame him? He's Harrison Ford. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that classroom looks like, I can't, I don't know if that classroom is a set or if it's the real thing, but. That's a good question. But the prop department definitely made it look like he actually works there. Oh, yeah. I will say, like, with all the stuff on his desk and and like Han Solo, Indiana Jones is a non-believer, you know, at least yeah. at the beginning anyway. <laughs> well, that that's one of the funny, that's, that's one of the things that's funny in retrospect. With all of these movies, the... yeah, as he like witnesses yeah. like supernatural events and like all these movies, because in this it, one. Especially since Temple of Doom takes place before this. Because, and another thing, Temple of Doom is like, that involves like Hinduism. Yeah, this this one involves Judaism, and then the third one's like Christianity. Um, yeah. So he's like seen like <laughs> three different religions competing. I guess I don't know. <laughs> this is kind of a weird universe that this movie takes I, place in. He he has that line when he's giving the exposition where he talks about the powers of the Ark, and he says, "Well." If you believe in that sort of thing. If you believe in that sort of thing, yeah. I, I've seen somebody talk online about it, and they said he probably thinks it's all just bullshit because he saw uh, the power of Sheba just a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, because that's it's another like, thing. Uh, Temple of Doom takes place before this movie does. Yeah. It's a prequel. So you, you can imagine he was probably very confused by the end of this one. He was also possessed in a lot of that movie that's too. That's right. <laughs> so who knows? Um And another thing I like is they show the map of like where he's going in this movie. Oh yeah. And they have like the red line tracing his flights, which is obviously like something it's not like it didn't originally start in this movie. Hell, yeah. I think Casablanca did something kind of like that, but and speaking of Casablanca, I feel like that movie had to be a big influence on this. Cause oh, it has to be. There's quite a few parallels, especially that bar scene with Marion. Yeah. Her first line to him is almost exactly like a line from Casablanca. Because <laughs> she like says, I always knew you'd come walking through my door. 
Whereas in Casablanca, it was it's of all the all gin the joints and all the towns in the... all the world, she walks into mine. Yeah. Yep. Which I guess makes um, India uh, Rick Blaine then. <laughs> and hell, this movie kind of feels like a mashup between two Humphrey Bogart movies, Casablanca and Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And his character arc is kind of similar, actually, where he's like kind of <laughs> he's more cynical at the beginning of the movie than he is at the end of it. But anyway, um, and obviously Nazis. I mean, Nazis are in Casablanca. <laughs> Yeah. And the setting, too. The setting definitely feels like, yeah. And uh, another thing we should mention, Harrison Ford and Karen Allen, they have great chemistry in this. Oh, yeah. You you definitely believe their backstory, which is just that they were supposed to get married and then Indy just ditched. Yeah. I've hated you for the last ten years or whatever. And she said, but yeah. And Karen Allen's great in this movie, too. It's a, it, Oh, yeah. I really... I don't think any of the other love interests were ever as good as Marion was. Like, she was perfect. Not really. Perfectly cast in this. So, I mean, in, in the second one, Willie's is just more so annoying than anything. And then in the third one, the love interest turns out to be a Nazi. Yeah. So, can't have that. And then they bring Marion back in the fourth one. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that. Um... Which I find it strange they're not bringing her back for the fifth one, but again, well, that is a little strange. And obviously, yeah, she, she he's looking for the staff of Ra, and she claims she doesn't have it. The medallion, sorry, the medallion. <laughs> yeah, the headpiece to the staff of Ra. Some Nazis show up, including uh, Tote. Who just has a great introduction. He is such... I love how much of a slime ball this dude is. He is just... Evening, Fraulein. And his voice, like... I was trying to figure out, like, why... Because he's one... He's definitely one of the most memorable Indiana Jones villains, but he doesn't have, like, oh, yeah. a lot of depth to him. No, it, I, think I, I think I read somewhere that he only has, like, 16 lines in the whole film. But he is so creepy and unsettling, like... He makes an impression. He's so, I think him. it's just, he's such an unusual character. Like, he <laughs> he looks weird. Like, his, like, he, he's, like, always wearing this huge black trench coat, even though he's in the desert, for one thing. <laughs> and his voice, like, he has such a strange voice, too. It's kind of this almost whispery voice. Yeah. Kind of nasally. And then I've obviously heard he's been compared to like uh Peter Lorre, which I can kind of see. Uh yeah. And then he also gets uh he tries to pick up the headpiece the staff oh, around yeah. <laughs> while it's hot. And so then he gets the headpiece burned into his palm, which just kind of looks it's just an interesting detail that gets added to him. I love that part. Yeah, then the Nazis, they like are <laughs> digging in the wrong place because they only have one <laughs> side of the headpiece. Yeah. yeah, that's so good. And that makeup, okay, that makeup job is great too. It actually looks like it, it was burned into his hand. And it always reminds me of Home Alone where uh, <laughs> Harry like burns his hand on the doorknob. Which that movie was probably I, referencing Raiders of the Lost Ark with that scene. I, I just I just found a video called Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it's only Arnold Tote. It's it's just a five minute video of every shot that he's in, I think. Yeah, of course the the shot they use for the video. <laughs> He gets the most memorable death scene out of oh, any of these yeah. movies, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, <laughs> but th I, I want to talk about this bar fight for a little bit. This whole bar fight is just fantastic. Oh, uh, it it's so chaotic and so good. There's like one small part where like some of the barrels with like alcohol in them get like busted, and then Marion's like drinking out of them, taking a drink. That's pretty good, and it's also uh, pretty bloody too. Oh yeah, for this is like only a PG movie. But granted, PG thirteen wasn't a thing yet, but I'm like, wow. Yeah. But so again, we keep saying this. We'll get into this later. But the PG rating is so funny considering what happens at the end. It, it yeah, <laughs> it is yeah. 
<laughs> it almost uh, again i'll talk about that a little bit later but and i think that's another thing with like the ones after temple of doom is they they kind of became less gritty yeah as they went along like because the fight scenes just don't have as much of an impact in the later ones as they do here because like indy's getting all bloodied up too like he he looks like just there's that yeah. big sherpa guy that like grabs him i like how everything's just catching on fire during this scene too <laughs> and he's like the guy's arm catches on fire and he tries punching indiana jones even though his arm is on fire <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's so good. And I like the... It, it It does, like, the fight scenes and stuff, they feel realistic, but there is a lot of humor in it, too. Oh, yeah. Balance it out. Like, I, I sometimes forget how funny these movies are. And Harrison Ford, his, like, sarcastic demeanor just sells it. You know, oh, yeah. Just, it's, it's perfect for the movie. Especially in uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Oh, fuck it, I'll talk about it right now. The the part where he uh, encounters that swordsman in Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> that That's just such a great fight scene. It's not a uh, fight scene, he just shoots the guy. Because <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy just jumps out, does all these fancy moves with a sword, and he just shoots him and moves on. And what's funny, that originally was supposed to be a fight scene. But I yeah. think Harrison Ford had caught, like... I think it was diarrhea or something. I think he had like dysentery yeah. or something. I don't remember. Yeah. But like he didn't want to shoot either way. He didn't want to shoot a huge fight scene. So they, all he does is he just pulls out a gun and shoots the guy. But and they did eventually shoot a fight scene. But they thought the comedic timing on that take was so good that they just <laughs> left it in the movie. <laughs> and I'm glad they did because it, it's, it, it's it's really funny. It's one of the most memorable parts of the movie. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah. But. Like, there is humor, but also, like, the action scenes, they're really well shot. They're really exciting, too. Like, it moves. It's, like, yeah. almost a two-hour movie, but it moves fast, too. Like, it, and it's, like, there's some scenes in this that are actually really intense. Like, that car chase, yeah. where he's, like, he grabs onto a truck from horseback. He like, He's, like, <laughs> fucking... He uses the whip to, like, get dragged behind the truck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a very impressive stunt right there. Like, which had been done before, but, like, not quite like that. Yeah. Hey, another fight scene that's pretty fun is the fight against the German mechanic. Absolutely, when, yes. When he and Marion are trying to steal the airplane. And that's another one of those that just has such a memorable end to it. Yeah. Because... <laughs> The, the mechanic is this giant, like, tough guy, essentially. He looks like a strong man that you'd find out at a circus. Basically. He does! Yeah, he really fucking does. And I also love how the dude just takes his shirt off before fighting him. <laughs> and he, he yells at him in German, something like, Hey, thin man, come down here and fight. Uh, and what happens is he beats... Uh, one thing I have heard about Indy. this movie is that some of the yeah. German is actually pretty terrible. I I wouldn't I wouldn't expect anything less honestly. There's like some bad like I think that for like maybe one of the like blue rays or something I think they redubbed some of it but Oh I really? I have no idea. I have no idea. I I don't speak German so I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And this is a but really yeah. good fight too. I also like how it, the like this whole fight and stuff is like also setting off like a chain reaction like Yeah. Like, the plane moving that way is, like, tipping over stuff. It's just... It's a really complicated, like... Fuck, I'm trying to think of, like, a way to, like... Describe it. But, like, it feels very intricate, like, the way it was, like, set yeah. up. You know? And, of course, at the end of the fight, the mechanic gets his head sawed off by the propeller you don't see it though but you see the blood yeah it <laughs> was either way that's still like holy shit for a pg movie wow <laughs> but he was a nazi he had it coming <laughs> <laughs> um a lot of this movie looks like lawrence of arabia too yeah which if you don't know that's like spielberg's favorite movie so i mean obviously he's gonna pay homage to that so you're in there and 
Indiana, uh, at one point when uh, Indy and Sala are going to look at the, um, going to the map room, he's even sort of wearing a similar outfit. The uh, uh, Well of Souls, where he's like got the yep, staff. Yes, yeah. yes, he does. And that's another thing we should talk about, Sala. Let's talk about Sala. <laughs> yeah. John Reese davies so, he's, I love how jolly this dude is. I know. He he's the comic relief, but it's slightly different than how most movies make their comic relief character. Yeah, he's always like singing Gilbert and Sullivan songs too. Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> because you know, like compare it to like something like Willow, where the comic relief are just like two somewhat annoying characters that are just constantly cracking jokes that kind of take you out of the movie. Sala feels very believable. Like, like, he's comic relief, but in a believable way. There's a lot of humor in this, but it feels organic. It's, like, based yes. around the character's personalities. It's like, uh, I remember, like, there was, like, an Irvin Kirshner, like, quote, where he was, like, talking about how he, like, he, like, he wanted to put humor in Empire Strikes Back, but not gags. Mm. And I feel like this is kind of the same thing, where they're trying to, like, the humor is yeah. more off of, like, the character's personalities rather than, like... A joke you know yeah because it is a really funny movie but it's not like a they don't overdo it or anything you know like in uh some other movies we've done on the podcast that i won't bring up yeah um and another scene i think um the part where uh indiana jones is talking to uh, sala it's when they're talking to that old dude who's like explaining the staff of Ra, like the yep. you know, what's etched on like the back of it. Like his demeanor in that scene, like the way it just switches instantly when he finds out the monkey died of poison and he catches the yeah. date. Like he goes from being really super happy to being really concerned, like just like that, and it's done perfectly. Yeah. He's just able to switch it just like that, you know bad dates <laughs> and there there is one line of his when they're about to jump down to the tomb that's pretty funny oh yeah yeah i know what when he, you're he drops the torch down these snakes all over the ground and he goes asps very dangerous you go first and of course that's where you get the famous slut some other famous lines like why does the floor move or yeah and then indiana jones he like sees the snakes and he's just so horrified snakes why did it have, have to be to snakes? snakes? You know, which that's definitely one of the most famous Indiana Jones lines. Um, and I also just love the part where he's using the staff of Ra to find the location of the Ark. Oh yeah, that whole scene. There's no dialogue during it. It's just perfectly shot and scored and edited as well. Like the sound design. We have to talk about the sound design. Like the sound design of this movie. Sound design is perfect. Like the sound effects, I know the punch sound effects. Yeah, it's like the, the the punches are all like really meaty sounding. It's like satisfying. Yeah, punches don't actually sound like that in real life, but fuck <laughs> it, it sounds cooler that way. <laughs> if they did sound like that, I'd be getting in a lot more fist fights. <laughs> and also the the sounds that the like arc makes too, like towards yep. the end, it's just. Like the the whip sounds are very good. The whip sounds, yes, those are actual whip sounds, if I remember right. Um, they were like re recording them like many times for this movie. Um, and Harrison Ford was actually using that whip too. We should point out. Yeah, he had to be trained, obviously. Uh, one one thing I heard about is the the sound effect of the uh, arc lid slamming down was the sound of a toilet lid being slammed <laughs> really yeah but it sounds huh. you would never yeah yes i mean who slams a fucking like to I, I, I guess <laughs> i don't know fully artists are strange people yeah ben burt i've learned quite a bit about ben burt from watching some of the star wars making of things. yeah um and there's a really funny scene between Belloc and Marion, where they're uh, she's like captured in a tent, so she's still alive. Like the explosion didn't actually kill her, but mm -hmm. yeah, she's like in the tent with Belloc. Like he like gives her a dress and like 
There's like one line he says, if you're trying to escape, the desert is three weeks in every direction. So please eat something. Because <laughs> he like brought in some food. He brought in some wine. And they're like getting drunk. <laughs> yeah. But Marion's also like trying to escape. She like pulls a knife on him. And Belloc like bursts out laughing. And we actually get kind of a gag. Yes, scene, okay, too, this is, is technically this is a gag, but like yeah. yeah, Tote shows up. He pulls out it looks like a torture device. But and then, then he, he like folds, folds it, it's it up a coat hanger. It's a coat hanger, which apparently that was something Spielberg tried doing that in uh, 1941. Yeah, I was about to mention that. Apparently yeah. A, like basically everything in that movie it didn't work so <laughs> they decided <laughs> let's uh he said i'm gonna put that in basically i'm gonna try putting it in every one of my movies until it works <laughs> so it only took another movie for him to actually work again so <laughs> yeah and it works it's pretty good actually <laughs> and to he's just in this scene like it's he's so it's so funny, but so creepy at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, like, where he's like, there's like one line he says to Marion where he, he says Americans always overdress for the wrong occasions, yet he's wearing a fucking huge <laughs> black trench, trench coat, coat in the desert. In the middle of the desert. <laughs> oh my goodness. How does that, uh, oh, I bet he's dying of like sweat. And then like, when he that shot where he like sits down and then says now what shall we talk about <laughs> it's so perfectly delivered and like shot it's so good it's so yeah. good i quote that line so much like just <laughs> and i also just find that the interactions between belloc and the nazis i just find kind of funny too yeah, you can tell that they don't really like each other. At Especially all. Uh, Dietrich. He does not like Belloc. Like, he's yeah. like the. One of the. <sighs> I guess he's the one that's in command, but then you got Tote, who's like SS. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I I'm... think Tote technically outranks him. I'm not sure how the that Nazis. SS doing all the way work. out in the desert, though. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Like, because, like, they're mad at him because he's taking so long to find the Ark. But he's, like, mad at them because, like, uh, Belloc, he, like, says, your methods of archaeology are too primitive. You'd use a bulldozer to find a china cup. <laughs> <laughs> this is just great. Um, and also, Belloc gets mad at the Nazis because they, like, throw Marion down in that tomb with Indy. Yeah. And he's, like, saying, the girl was mine! You know, he's just... Because <laughs> another thing, Indiana Jones and uh, Belloc, they're competing over the same woman, too. So They're trying to find the same artifact. Trying to... Yes. Get the same woman? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And that scene where they're down in that, uh, down in there with, like, all the snakes and stuff, it's pretty good. Dude, yeah. Like Marion's, like, at one point, Marion, like, sees his whip and thinks it's a snake, and she tries burning it with a torch. <laughs> That's a pretty good part there. Yeah. And there's also where you get, uh, Indiana in Jones, he's, like, trying to, like... I guess we are kind of recapping this, but just out of order. But like, I love how he uses the Anubis statue to knock a hole in the wall. Oh yeah. And then also, also the part when they're down there and Marion ends up uh, in that like chamber full of the skeletons. Yeah, the part with the mummies. Yeah, that part's kind of freaky right there. <laughs> That's like the one scene in this movie that like. Well, one of the scenes in this movie that you're kind of like, oh, that could fit into, like, Temple of Doom or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, there are mummies in Temple of Doom, if I remember right. Uh, one of my... F I think my favorite Indiana Jones line, though, is this exchange between him and Sala. Where... Uh, <laughs> the, like, does the Nazis, they took the Ark, he has to go, like... 
catch up to him and he like says i'm going after that truck and then saul says how and then Indiana jones says i don't know i'm making this up as i go <laughs> that's very accurate to indy's character i feel per- i was about to say that that line perfectly sums up his character <laughs> Because, again, he has to think of, like, a quick thing to do to escape, and he always manages to find one, you know? He's always thinking on his toes. I just, I love, that Uh, that line also is just so perfect for Harrison Ford, too. He delivers it so deadpan. Yeah. It's so good. So this is completely out of order. This is something that happened earlier in the movie that I just remembered finding funny. So there's this monkey that's introduced, and... They're basically using, uh, this guy's using the monkey to essentially track down Indy and Marion. The dude with the, uh, eye patch. Yep. Well, so, the dude with the eye patch and the monkey go up to inform a German soldier, and both the man with the eye patch and the monkey give a Nazi salute. Forgot about that, yeah. The and, Na- and the, and the soldier looks confused, but he salutes the monkey back. The monkey does a Nazi salute. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Oh, that's such a horrible thing to do to a monkey, man. <laughs> but what I think is even funnier is the is the soldier the soldier salutes back. That is really funny, yeah. <laughs> but the uh I'm making this up as I go line, that also just kinda sums up Lucas and Spielberg's like work ethic hmm. with these movies. <laughs> Cause they had three they were planning on doing three movies if this one was a success, but then, like, they didn't have the other two planned out, so they had to make it up (laughs) as they went along. (laughs) But, yeah. Um, That truck chase, that's... That part's really good. He gets hit in the face with a mirror. And his scream sounds very similar to um, when Harrison Ford, like, screams in uh, Empire... When he's being tortured by Vader at Cloud City. Yeah. Who knows, maybe Vader was torturing him by hitting him with a mirror. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, another line that really sums up his character, uh, Marion says to Indy, you're not the man I knew ten years ago. And then Indy says, it's not the years, It's not the years, it's the mileage. It's the mileage, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Which, when I was younger, I didn't get that line. But now it, I totally get it. It makes some total sense to his character. And another thing that's great about this movie, when I was rewatching, I was like thinking, you know, it's actually pretty perfect. The Ark of the Covenant, one of the symbols of the Jewish religion, is taking down Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, starting with that part where, like, the Ark of the Covenant, like, it's in a crate. And the crate has a swastika on it, and it, like, burns up the swastika. Yep. <laughs> That's pretty good. And then, of course, the ending of the movie, which we'll definitely be talking quite a bit about that ending. It, is it about time to move on? To the we ending? are almost to it, but there, there, <laughs> I like the part where Indiana Jones has, like, the rocket launcher. Oh, yeah, and he's threatening to blow up the Ark. And Belloc gets some pretty good lines here. He like says, you're going to give mercenaries a bad name. <laughs> and a misconception a- here is that he uh, swallows a fly during that I was party. just about to mention that. There, there's the part where he's just talking and it looks like a fly goes into his mouth. It did go into his mouth, but he didn't swallow it. Yeah. He didn't actually swallow it, but that is kind of a funny shot. Right? And I also like Belloc's line where he says... Indiana, we are simply passing through history. This, this is history. You know, he's talking about the Ark, you know, because yeah. obviously Indiana Jones, he's not going to blow up the Ark of the Covenant. He cares too much about archaeology to do that. And yeah, then they finally, the Nazis decide to hold a ceremony where they open up the Ark of the Covenant. Brilliant idea. They've got Belloc dressed up like a rabbi, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That costume. And he's performing some sort of prayer as he's walking towards the ark. Preparing that costume's to open it. great. I th- I think he's speaking in Hebrew, <laughs> if I remember right. But yeah, not that I, not that I would know that, but I just read that somewhere. Um, and they open up the ark, and there's like just sand. 
And so at, at first, uh, Totes just kind of laughing because it's like, oh, this whole thing was worthless. I yeah. love this dude's laugh. It is so funny. Like, just... <laughs> Belloc, he's just like... The others are just so disappointed and disgusted, and he's just laughing his ass off. It's so funny. Like, I, I read somewhere, somebody described it as like a hyena laugh or something, and that's a pretty good <laughs> way to describe yeah. it. Yeah. And then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, we literally. Um, <laughs> one of the most memorable just death scenes in the history of movies. Like, the Wrath of God basically wipes out all the Nazis. Yeah, and and so for all just like the, the grunts, they just get like electrocuted to death, essentially. It's just a spectacular special effects extravaganza. It is. Which, the way they did that, if I remember right, they had, like, where the Nazis are getting shocked, like, is they had, like, I think, lamps in their clothing or something. And then they oh, added really? in the effect, like, later. Um, Huh. And one of those unforgettable death scenes is, uh... <laughs> you got the face melting well but before that so dietrich uh the other nazi commander his face essentially gets sucked in on itself very quickly and it's an impressive effect if i remember right they like used a vacuum on like a dummy to like suck air Mm. out of it yeah and then tote oh my god his face like especially it's so satisfying too just because of how evil this dude is like, yeah and the face melts is super fast and the whole time you're hearing tote scream it's oh yeah yeah he's like still alive while it's happening jesus christ <laughs> and they actually the way they did that is they melted like a <sighs> it was like a wax dummy i think that they let over that they just let melt over several hours and sped up the footage. They had, like, gelatin in it, if I remember mm-hmm. right, to, like, for the blood, but yeah. It's like, the, the face melting, like, that's one of those death scenes, like, the chest bursting scene in Alien, where yeah. you just never forget it once you've seen it. Yeah. Cause it's so gruesome, and it's so well done. When I was a kid, my parents, they did let me watch this movie, but they would basically have a skip over this yeah. scene. Because <laughs> like, it's so graphic. Like, it's amazing that this got a PG rating. I know. It's so over the top and just disgusting. But it wasn't that part that... Because this movie actually did almost get an R rating, but not because of the face melting. It was because of Belloc's yep. death. Because his head explodes... They, I think they put, like, meat in, inside yeah, of it. It looks like ground beef, essentially, if you watch the effect. Yeah, they, like, his head just explodes. That almost got it an R rating, but then they put, like, fire in front of it. Yeah. So it'd be less graphic. But yeah, I mean, what could possibly be a more satisfying way to kill Nazis than by <laughs> just, like, god damn. Annihilating them. That's so good, yeah. And again, that gave like people were like screaming in the movie theater because it comes because <laughs> it comes out of nowhere. It's so <laughs> it kind of is a bit of a Deus Ex Machina to be up, but it's it's so well done that like uh, the sound design during that scene I should put is just yes. incredible to like. And I like the ghosts, too. The ghost yeah. effects. Like, I like the... At first, it looks like a woman, but then its face changes into, like, a skeleton. And yeah. it just snarls at them. Oh, it's so good. And, hey, at least the Nazis didn't get the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> yeah. It just gets shoved in a warehouse somewhere. Well, okay, we do find out where eventually, but... Yeah. It's being looked after by top men. Who? Top men. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, that basically that's the movie. Um Yeah. It it again works the 
same way that Star Wars did, where it took all these, like, old concepts and made them new again. Yeah. You know? It, it was able to brush it up and deliver it in such a way that it works for modern audiences without losing any of the charm. And I mean, now, okay, there's going to be some stuff about the movie, like, that doesn't quite pull. I mean, some of the effects look a little bit dated, you know, cause it's like 40-year-old yeah, it's, it's, it's not as bad as some parts of Temple of Doom. The cultural but... uh, depictions. Yeah. Mm, some of them, yeah, but more so in Temple of Doom. Um, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um <laughs> But it's just, it's every aspect of the filmmaking here, the directing, the writing, the edit, the, we really take for granted how good the script for this movie is. Yeah. I think it really helped you have, that you had the same writer of Empire Strikes Back working on this. Um, the music, one of the best music scores ever, if you ask me. One of John Williams' best scores. Like, that dude's a legend for a reason. Yeah. It's movies like this that remind me why I love film scores so much. Because I I think it's it's not just my favorite John Williams score. I think it's one of, if not my most favorite film score of all time. I'd put Star Wars above it, but this is really damn close. It, and again, like they decided, they chose orchestra. You know, they didn't like. Because imagine if this had, yeah. like, a synthesizer score. It would have... This movie would have become <laughs> way more dated. The Indiana Jones score composed by John Carpenter. It would sound sort of like the uh, Super Nintendo uh, <laughs> Indiana Jones music. You know. The set design, like, they look like actual temples. Yeah. And stuff, and actual ruins. One Easter egg I always hear about but I never notice it when I wa when I'm actually watching the movie is that some of the hieroglyphics show uh C three PO and R two D two. Yeah. I never notice it while I'm watching the movie just because I'm so invested in the movie. <laughs> exactly. Which uh, that's another thing. This is shot in like some of the same locations as Star Wars. Tunisia. Like the the part where they're walking through that canyon, I think that's the same canyon where R two D two gets attacked by the Jawas. <laughs> Really? I think it is, if I remember right. Huh. It looks a hell of a lot like it, at the very least. Yeah. The characters. I love Indiana Jones. You know, he's one of the best, like, heroes, like, in cinema. Very, yeah. like, just from, like, you can see his shadow and you pr practically know who he is already. I mean, he's that iconic. And his theme, obviously, very iconic. Belloc, he's a great villain. I just love how smarmy that dude is. He's yeah. Just so, he's just so good. He's he's the complete antithesis of Indiana Jones, and he works perfectly. Uh, Marion's great. Really, the whole cast is really... Everybody's pretty well cast. It, it, everything came together just about perfect. The cinematography, for this movie. the cinematography yeah. in this movie is gorgeous. There's so many good camera shots. Like probably my favorite is uh when they're digging like at night for the Ark of the Covenant. You can just see their shadows. That's a yeah. great shot. There's a lot of good shots in this movie though. The props look great. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant, they had to make that thing for yeah. the movie. And the, the Staff of Ra and the Idol. Those are all props, but they look really real. And then, of course, the special effects at the end are just perfect. The special effects, yeah, the sound effects. <laughs> Again, like Star Wars, Ben Burt, he really shows why sound is so important in movies. I can't really think of too many negatives. I mean, it's I honestly don't really... pretty close to being perfect. I know there's some people, they try to make the argument that Indiana Jones doesn't do much in this movie to advance yeah, the I, plot. Yeah, I remember that was a thing in one of the Big Bang Theory episodes where one of the characters 
points out. Yeah. I haven't seen that episode, but I've just mm-hmm. heard about it. Yeah. What well, one of the characters, I think it's, uh, I don't remember her name. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, one of the characters basically says no matter what the Nazis would have opened it anyway. And they would have been killed anyway, so what was the point of Indy being there? But, but like, also, he had to get the Ark back to America. Yeah. yeah. Which he did, so yeah. It just. But I think it does, like, because, but the thing is, how do you expect him to do everything? He's one guy against the entire <laughs> the Nazis. Nazi regime. And they're yeah. a step ahead of him the whole time. That's kind of the point of the movie, but. But also, going by that logic, you can say that about literally all of these movies. All yeah. of them. But, and honestly, people, you know, people who would try to nitpick a movie like this, they're probably too cynical to appreciate it anyway, <laughs> so, fuck it. Um, and I, I will, one thing I will say, though, this movie, it definitely is more about moments than about narrative. Yeah. It's structured in a more episodic way. Than some people might be used to, which is the point. It, it's supposed to be like an adventure serial where there's a cliffhanger every like 15 minutes, basically. Yeah. I'd kind of like to see somebody edit this into like one of those things like where. That would be interesting. You know, will he uh, survive? Find out next week. You know, something like that. Yeah. This is my I would this is my favorite Indiana Jones movie, I would say. Although personally, I think, I, I think the first three Indiana Jones movies are almost perfect. Very strong. As p- far as pure escapism goes. But this one's the yeah. strongest by far. This one set <laughs> the bar so high that, I, I like, again, I can't really actively think of anything I dislike about it. Mm-hmm. Unless I, like, go, like, okay, like, a little nitpicky stuff. But, you know. Whereas with. Temple of Doom and Last Crusade, I could probably point to some negatives. Not many, but some things that I think are amiss. But Raiders of the Lost Ark, I honestly think this is very, very close to being just a perfect movie. At least as far as this genre goes. You know, action, adventure type movies. Because maybe there's movies with better acting or better writing. There, There are, but like... As entertainment, this is like like A plus material right here. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. No, you can go, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so for me, uh I haven't rewatched Last Crusader yet. Uh, but just from what I remember in the past. Wait, is it called Last Crusader close. or Last Crusade? <laughs> Last Crusade, sorry. You said Last Crusader? <laughs> sorry. Yes. <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Um, keep going. Uh, but uh, Those two are very close for me, just from what I remember, but every time I rewatch Raiders, it's always a good time. Like, I never regret rewatching it. It's not a movie that gets worse the more you watch it's it. It's actually gotten... I actually appreciate it more now than I did when I was younger. Because when I was younger, I thought it was a great action movie, obviously. But, like, now I appreciate the, like, dialogue and the characters yeah. more. So it's, especially Belloc. Like, as a kid, I just, I didn't really think too much about Belloc as a villain. But, like, now I'm, like, thinking, this guy's a very well-written villain. Like, this is how you should do a villain, you know, yeah. in these types of movies. And of course, you know, as a kid, I wanted to be Indiana Jones. I mean, it's just like <laughs> a lot of kids did, you know. Like I said, I, I still, upstairs, I still have that Indiana Jones hat that I wore for Halloween that one time. But yeah, the, I have noticed, though, that, yeah, a lot of people say Last Crusade is their favorite Indiana Jones movie. Mm. So... I wouldn't be surprised if you if you end up saying that is your favorite when you rewatch it. Um, it, yeah, it, it, I'll be watching it here soon. So for me, the last few times I've rewatched it, I haven't liked it as much as Raiders: The Lost Ark. Although that mm. it, that wasn't always the case, though. Like as a kid, I actually think Last Crusade was my favorite, but I think that's because that was the first one I saw. Mm. Whereas now I have them a little more in context, you know. Uh, do you have anything to add? 
I don't I don't really know if I have anything else to add on to this. It's just it's perfect. Yeah, it's me. It's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you don't like it, um, I what's wrong with you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> God, imagine if. Uh, I didn't look up Larry Malton's review, but imagine if he didn't like oh, this no. one. Jesus. If, if he doesn't, then I, I would be very sad. Alright, I have just one other thing. Okay. Uh, I, I went and rewatched the end scene again from Raiders. Uh, so, when Tote's face is melting, you can hear like him gargling as he's screaming, as his face is melting. God, that's... Yeah. <laughs> Just to make his death even more disturbing. <laughs> I know. Because I, I, I first saw that movie was like eight or nine, and I didn't see the face melting until later, but mm-hmm. I had read the novelization, though, so I could imagine what it would look like. And, and I'd yeah. seen pictures of it, too, and just pictures of it. I was like, Jesus, that's fucked up. <laughs> Good night, you stupid idiot. <laughs> Good night, you miserable slob. 